I want to talk to you about, you know, uh, casual conversations you have with people, like you go to a party. Imagine 30 years ago, people were like, AI? Now it's probably like, AI? So how has it changed? How has your life changed? Well, think of AI as a tool, as a uh, spreadsheet on steroids. That's a pretty good model. So it's an automated computing. When you click, computations happen and results come out, and they're amazingly accurate. And the, 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 the black magic in the spreadsheet is what uh, AI can do. But ultimately, it only computes, and it does some results, but it isn't human intelligence. It's a tool that we can throw a lot of data at it and have it come out and say, uh, I think you're most likely to buy this product. I think we can maximize um, user retention by, use, by showing you this content. Or we think the face we're looking at is most likely this person, next likely that person. Uh, or we should steer the car a little bit to the left given what we see on the cameras in an autonomous vehicle. So this decision-making uh, brain inside AI is built upon large amounts of data, works only in one very narrow domain, and it makes kind of a discrete decision. So it is much, much less than the scope of what we as humans can do. But yet, uh, a lot of this is very commercially valuable. And a lot of this is what um, many people do for large percentages of their jobs, if their jobs are routine or repetitive. Mm. So it has huge impact to the society, even though this breakthrough is more like a, another spreadsheet, another database, less like uh, another species, and not at all like another species. Uh, I want to talk about the present and the future um, and your vision of the future, but I, but I want to talk about something that you said that I thought was really interesting because uh, it, it breaks into two different columns, research, implementation, and I kind of think of that as ideas and execution. Yes. And you've said the U.S. is pretty good with the research piece, implementation not so much so. So give me the playing field out there. What does it look like? Well, before there could be implementation, there needed to be the research breakthroughs. And they have happened, uh, in particular, about 10 years ago, a technology called deep learning. And the enhancements built around it in the past 10 years have become the solid pillar on which all modern functioning AI is built on. And that research is basically done. So now the question is more, who can build good buildings now that we can all get that great foundation. So in terms of um, applying uh, deep learning to uh, banks and insurance companies and healthcare and cancer cure and autonomous vehicles, uh, I think companies in countries, all the countries in the world are racing ahead to, to make progress. Now there may be another breakthrough, but based on the last 10 years, we haven't seen another one. So yes, there can be another breakthrough which can give a university, a country, or a company some advantages, but we haven't seen one for a while. And, I, and the last breakthrough, deep learning, has so much more commercial value that hasn't been properly reaped. So, uh, so we're very excited as a venture capitalist to look for entrepreneurs who will apply deep learning, implement it, and make money and create value. So that's why we're excited about the business we're in. And we're hopeful someone will make another breakthrough, but those uh, can't be planned and may not be uh, that quick. An example of deep learning is Meitai, which means beautiful vegetable. Lee founded the company in 2014 with a goal of sourcing vegetables for about 10 million small and medium-sized restaurants. It allows owners to use an app on their smartphone to order specialties like bok choy and eggplant directly from farms. The data helps farmers control the amount of vegetables they produce in a season. It means no overproduction or wasting water and fertilizer. You mentioned build buildings, and when you think of building buildings, you think of uh, China, you think of infrastructure, yes. uh, and you hear in the U.S., we need more infrastructure projects. So is China leaping ahead in this regard, do you think? Yes, uh, using the bed building metaphor, China once built a hotel in 15 days. So um, similarly, the execution, the dedication, the hard work, 
to the optimization uh, are all aspects of Chinese entrepreneurship. Uh, the Chinese entrepreneurs we fund often work 100 hours or more a week. And to them, there's nothing other in their lives other than being successful in the company that devoted to. And they're willing to do whatever it takes to be successful. So they're not um, you know, uh, religious about the particular algorithm or about uh, being the first uh, to invent something. They're much more pragmatic about um, how to win the market how to become the number one in the market, how to make the market larger. So if that requires uh, not a scientific breakthrough, but um, hiring a lot of engineers to build something quickly, or hiring a lot of people to label data, or go collect a lot of data, um, or go hire a lot of people to, to, uh, to make deliveries, whatever it took, um, the entrepreneurs will do that in order to succeed. So this result-driven, hard-working, winner-take-all, and a tenacious culture of entrepreneurship, uh, coupled with a lot of venture capital coming into this field, has created the most effective execution engine in the world. And that's what is keeping China ahead in not just AI, but generally in executing quickly uh, in all kinds of uh, areas. Um, mobile payment is another example where China leads the world. It just happens faster for all those reasons I mentioned, and that will be an advantage for China as well. And the data, uh, there's, there's more data available. I mean, there's more people in China as well. And you know, you talk about, I, I know you've talked about in the past, WeChat, uh, people don't carry, I mean, they don't need to carry a wallet. They don't carry money, they don't carry credit cards. It's all with the phone, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, so data is actually the rocket fuel for AI. Uh, because AI doesn't work on human programming every intricate detail. You know, when you uh, talk to an um, AI conversational robot, it's not programmed as if he says this, I should consider this response and put in the slots. It's actually completely driven by past data. So it builds out what it should say to you based on all the things people have ever said in such conversations and more based on whether saying something leads to a positive outcome, user satisfaction, more money being made. So data is what drives the quality of the AI and the profitability of the company. So data is all important and China has more data than any, uh, any other country by far, not only because it has a larger user base, uh, four times of the U.S., for example, but, uh, but also for each user, the usage depth is more. So there's collection of your payment. In the U.S., payments could be by cash or credit card, but in China, it's all captured within the ecosystem. So more, more breadth in users and more depth in the usage. So all that data uh, makes the, also makes the Chinese uh, AI work better. So artificial intelligence doesn't actually have the capability to think and relies on the data humans generate on a daily basis. Chinese traffic police are increasingly using facial recognition technology to identify jaywalkers and then automatically issuing fines by text. Authorities in Xinjiang are using facial recognition surveillance cameras that can identify suspected criminals. Their faces then displayed on large screens at street crossings and on a government website about AI today because uh, a lot of people talk about you know the, the future five years out ten years out 15 years out but but there are applications today right uh, there are a lot of applications virtually every internet application that you use has AI behind it because once you've got um, a couple of million users that's enough data to train some AI system that that decides what you should see next so and that's very critical to the uh, apps that either want to retain you as a user on its app with your eyeballs, or convert you to paying within the app, or showing you something that you might take action upon, such as click, or pay, or buy, or trade, or something. So uh, how to present that UI to user interface to you uh, when you go to Amazon or, or Taobao, what picture of a product should it show to you uh, to entice you to click? That is AI behind it. So we don't feel it, but every app that we use, whether in US, China, or anywhere else, if it's at all popular, there is AI behind it. That's personalizing, targeting uh, for you to 
uh, become a more satisfied user and for the company to make uh, more money. That's the most popular kind of AI. Uh, there's, of course, AI behind speech recognition, uh, Alexa, Siri, um, and uh, the Baidu system, Alibaba system, etc. There is uh, AI behind the uh, face recognition, gesture recognition systems around. And there's AI uh, behind autonomous vehicles, although that's not yet fully deployed, but there are some places starting to deploy them on, uh, for parking, for, uh, uh, and some car manufacturers have uh, aut automated parking, that's AI. Some uh, have um, uh, automatic driving, stay in lane on the highway, that's AI. And then uh, there will be cars that completely self-drive on highways, and that's AI. So we're gonna see more and more, more of that. It's not always science fiction-like. You know, an app is just as, there's just as much AI, deep learning behind it, as the autonomous vehicle. AI has become all the rage in the automotive industry. U.S. car makers spent nearly $350 million on AI in 2018 alone. Forecasts expect this number to reach $3 billion by 2025. In the Innovation Center in Shenzhen, a bus avoids pedestrians, speeds up, slows down, brakes for emergencies, overtakes other cars, and navigates traffic lights. While it may look like a normal bus, it's actually controlled automatically. And while there's a driver in place for safety, during the entire route, his hands never touch the wheel and his feet never hit the brakes. This is one of four electric intelligent driving buses being tested on public roads. Let's talk about self-driving cars. I mean, when, when are we going to be out there on the road and looking around and there's nobody behind the wheel? I mean, is that far in the distance or is it soon? Uh, it's probably uh, going to take a little while for full adoption. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one is that uh, some roads are just much, much easier than other roads for machines. And interestingly, what autonomous vehicle is good at isn't what we're good at. It's almost the opposite. Uh, many drivers hate parallel parking, but um, autonomous vehicle can park perfectly because it can measure, because it's a fixed problem. It's not different every time. It's between two cars a certain distance. You have to turn at exactly the right angle. It's better than any human for that. Uh, autonomous vehicle is great on highways because on highways there are very little uh, variability. There are no uh, cross traffic, no red light, no stop sign, no pedestrians, you know, no, no babies, uh, strollers. So uh, basically all you have to do is stay in lane, don't get hit, and then uh, exit when you need to exit. Whereas for humans on the highway, the speed is very fast. If you fall asleep or don't pay attention or look at your phone and steering wheel turns 10 degrees, you could uh, be dead in, in, the, in the next uh, 20 seconds. So it's uh, very different. People are afraid of driving on highways, but uh, autonomous vehicles are very good at it. Uh, yet, there are places where the environment changes tremendously and every environment is different, like uh, Hutong, a small valley in, in Beijing. That could be very difficult. Um, you know, a country a side turn in mid-America in an uh, unnamed road, that could be difficult, not on the map, um, but not difficult for the autonomous vehicle. But for the human, you're just reacting, you know, to, 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 to the you know, cats and dogs and kids running around, and certainly you won't hit them if you're human because you recognize each one as is. But for the autonomous vehicle, uh, every baby, uh, you know, baby crawling versus a dog versus a doll, um, it's not clear computer vision can make that distinction given the variabilities in light, maybe it's a street light, and it doesn't know how to stop the car, get out and check if that's a doll or a baby. So, um, so the potential danger on people's lives make it really hard for autonomous vehicle to drive in these um, unknown, uh, unmapped, uh, tiny streets. So given that, uh, a full deployment, complete replacement of human driving is going to take a long time. Uh, one final point is that new cities, uh, smart cities, could accelerate this. And China is building some, some new cities. Uh, Xiong'an is a city near Beijing, the size of Chicago, being built from the ground up for autonomous vehicles. Uh, while that city will take um, 
uh, many years to construct. When it's done, uh, it will be immediately and, and hopefully fully ready for autonomous vehicle. Because if we think about it, uh, the limitations I talked about, the hutong, the alleys, um, and the, the, the mud roads, they were designed for human driving. And if we're thinking of a world where humans don't drive, one could already design a new city in which, um, in which it's uh, fully for autonomous vehicle. And I know that in the US, in New Mexico, as well in Saudi Arabia, a city called Neom are being constructed. So it's possible these uh, new smart cities will generate a lot of excitement for more and more cities to be built or rebuilt, and that could also accelerate the adoption of um, autonomous vehicles as well as other technologies. You mentioned the baby stroller, and, and I've heard critics uh, <coughs> of uh, self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles say, look, uh, the, the car's coming down, it's a computer. It doesn't have the same feelings as us. There's a little baby coming across in a stroller, there's going to be an accident, there's a bus with 60 people in it. Yeah. Does it take out one or does it take out 60? Us, as humans, would never think of flattening the baby in the stroller. We'd try and figure out something. The computer, it doesn't have feelings like us. What about the critics who make these points? Uh, what would you say to them? Well, first I would say most human decisions before accidents or avoidance of accidents were not made consciously. Because if you ask all the people, you know, well, how did you avoid that accident? Or why did you hit that car? And they'll say, well, it just went so fast, I can't tell because cars go that fast. Uh, we, we would like to think we're logically and morally evaluating every situation, but there's no time to do that. So I think that's just You think a, it's a false argument? Yeah, I think it's, um, um, it's an imagination that we have the, that ability all the time. We may sometimes, um, but you know, if we really saw a stroller and a big bus, I'm sure most of us just slam on the brakes and try to not hold either, not hit either. That's probably a good enough uh, uh, step for most people to actually sway away from the baby and intentionally hit the truck. I don't think our brains work that fast. So I think that's just um, uh, imagination. Um, but also I think uh, we can uh, program uh, things into uh, the AI that we think are the right optimization. So actually, we can make AI do a better job to what we human want us to do. If we want to say, um, never ever hit a baby, well, we can program that in. If we want to say, always minimize likely loss of lives over all similar incidents, we can do that too. So I think it's our own decision how we want to program AI and, uh, and then let it do a great job doing what we tell it to do. And uh, it can do that job much better than what we can do.